Hello, hello. Welcome, John Mackey, to Authors at Wharton. John, welcome to Philly. Thanks for inviting me. Why are you here? I don't know. It's really cold out there. I left, I left Austin. It was 70 degrees this morning, going up to 80. So I'm here because you invited me. Well, that's a good reason to say yes. You're one of my heroes because I love your books. Well, I'm honored, but I think you need to raise your standards for heroes, if that's the case. Well, what do you think? <laughs> Don't answer that question. Uh, or, or answer it anonymously later. Uh, but John, what I, you spent a lot of time speaking to students. Uh, it's clearly something that you're passionate about. Why? Well, what's, it's so stimulating to be around bright, young people who don't yet know what they can't do. So they haven't gone cynical on life, and they're the future. They're going to create the solutions. I always say that my generation solved a lot of problems my parents' generation couldn't solve, and that this generation is going to solve a lot of problems that my generation couldn't solve. So you, know, you just continue to advance the world. And the young people are the uh, creative and energetic and don't know what's impossible yet. I think you just described your younger self to a T. I think I described my older self. <laughs> also true. Uh, but take, take us back to what was, what was it that, that gave you the entrepreneurship bug? I mean, I didn't even know I was an entrepreneur because I was just very mission-driven in, in the day. I mean, I'll just give a brief recap. So when I was... 23 years old, going to University of Texas on the, you know, studying. I, I was just taking elective courses, to be clear, philosophy, religion, world literature, history, mostly the humanities, and um, wasn't in any hurry to, I wasn't, I wasn't interested, I just was knowledge hungry. I used to just go to the library and read 10, 12 hours a day. So I moved into this vegetarian co-op when I was 23 years old, a housing co-op, and uh, I moved in. I wasn't vegetarian at that time. I moved in. I thought, I am going to meet some super cool people in a vegetarian co-op. And I did. I met my girlfriend that I co-founded Whole Foods with. And I became a vegetarian. I learned how to cook. I had my whole food consciousness awakened. And so I came home to the co-op one night, and I was talking to my girlfriend, Renee. And I said, hey, Renee, what do you think, what do you think if we started our own store? And she said, that'd be fun. That'd be cool. Let's do it. She was only 19. That'd be cool. Let's do that. And I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. And so we did. And I often wondered how my life would be different if Renee had said, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't want to have any part of that. So I didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur. I just thought of myself as I was totally on fire about natural and organic foods. We created this first world called Safer Way. Safe Way. Safer way. And <laughs> it was in this old house. We didn't know anything. We didn't know anything. I took zero business classes. None. I've read hundreds of business books since then. And we opened it up. We got $45,000 of capital, which we managed to lose half in the first year. We lost $23,000. Renee and I lived in the store because on the first store was a, 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 a little natural food store, and then we had a vegetarian cafe. And then on the third floor, we had an office with a futon couch that we folded out. And uh, the joke is that we didn't have a shower. That place was not zoned to live in. We weren't supposed to be living there. But that was all we could afford. But there was a Hobart dishwasher. So I would, I would, we would shower in the Hobart dishwasher, which violated all health code. Thanks. So was I an entrepreneur? Yes, but I didn't know it. We, I was just doing, I was following my heart. I was, I was answering the call of the hero's journey, I think, that was in my heart. And uh, yeah, that's how I got started. Well, I think a lot of the undergrads and MBA students in the room are not old enough to remember that you were a little bit ahead of your time in terms of natural, organic, not even being in the lexicon for the most part. What was that like in the early days when you tried to explain what you wanted to do? You know, I think one of the, the best stories and, um, was when we went out to raise venture capital money. And um, we raised, just to show you how different the VC world is back in 1988, we raised, at that time, we were doing about $50 million a year and making about a $1 million a year in profits. And all we could get from the VCs, we got $4.5 million and had to give up 34% of the business. Right? But it was hard to get the VCs to invest. And one of them told me, he said, John, you've got a cute little business here, but... <laughs> Let's face it, you're just a bunch of hippies selling food to other hippies. Now, how big a market can that be? 
And I said, well, I think it's spreading. I think it's going to be a bigger market. And he said, well, yeah, you know, but then you'll, if, if it really does take off, how are you going to really compete with Safeway and Kroger and those guys? They're going to destroy you. And uh, so he, that's why he didn't invest. I don't know why he felt obligated to tell me that. I did run into him in a conference about 10 years later, and he said that was the single biggest mistake he ever made as a venture capitalist. So, but that was, that was it. We were a bunch of hippies that were, were just selling food to other young people. But what happened is it's like part of the, reason, the way to be successful in a business, part of it is an element of luck because the market has to move your way. It's like you're surfing. You've got to catch a wave that you can ride. And so we, Whole Foods helped create this market, but we also caught it at a good time. You said we're ahead of our time, but the time was shifting. Um, you, you've heard that saying that um, how do you make progress in the world? One funeral at a time. And the old generation dies out. The young people come in. They take over, make a mess of it in their own unique way. And so... Our generation uh, began, to, began to take over. The baby boomers took over, and our dietary way of eating began to spread throughout, you know, throughout the country. It's, it's almost comical to think about investors looking at your business and, and complaining that only young people were interested in it, right? Isn't well, that the best possible uh, sign for a business? Young people, I mean, if you see pictures of, like, the staff we had, nobody was over 30. Everybody had super long hair, and they were, you know, dressed. Some of us don't have that luxury, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I need to back up there. Well, you know, we had a few, we had a few people that didn't have hair, but they were still colorfully dressed, Adam. And All right, I feel better now. <laughs> I, I'm no longer excluded. Thank you. Go on. Anyway, it just uh, what was very interesting is that people began. We noticed over the first few years, people started showing up in our stores that they were dry, driving BMWs instead of VW Bugs and bicycles, and they were just. People, the middle class, the upper middle class began to migrate to Whole Foods, mostly women, and they didn't really understand natural and organic foods. But one of the things that really helped Whole Foods market was Walmart because Walmart was growing, they were growing so rapidly and they were beginning to open up their super centers and that was scaring the crap out of the major uh, conventional supermarket industry who had to compete with Walmart. They had unionized labor, they were very expensive, and... Um, and so they had to. They tried to get their prices down. So they started making their stores look more and more like warehouses. Cut their service back to the customers. They weren't really beautiful places to be in any longer. And so we began to see the middle class, upper middle class uh, women, start to come into Whole Foods. Not that they knew anything about natural and organic foods, but simply because our our team members looked weird to them. You know, they had piercings and tattoos and colorful hair. But they also were nice, and they weren't getting any kind of service in the conventional supermarkets. So Walmart did Whole Foods Market a big favor is because the supermarkets were so um, obsessed with competing on price with Walmart that it enabled Whole Foods Market to come in and, and create better service, higher quality, and a better experience for people. And I say we just flew under the radar of the conventional supermarkets for, I don't know, 20, 20 plus years. I don't think they really caught on until our market cap got up higher than Kroger's. Then all of a sudden, they woke up and began to compete with us very strongly. Better late than never, I suppose. No, it's my, it, the later, the better. <laughs> <laughs> for you, yes, not for them. Uh, so, John, tell me, tell me about the early leadership lessons you learned. I think uh, we have a lot of people in the audience who are aspiring, aspiring to run organizations one day, a lot of people who already are. Uh, what did you get wrong at first? Well, everything. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, so one of the interesting things, if you're an entrepreneur, is that uh, we reinvented the wheel constantly. But then again, we weren't limited by certain. Uh, we didn't know how it was supposed to be done. So that gave us the freedom to innovate. And, and when I was talking to Adam earlier, I really like his new book because I'm a guy that thinks again. I'm a rethinker. And always constantly thinking outside the box, asking, is there a better way? Is there a better way? Is there a better way? And the, so my, our first lessons were that uh, generally you could solve any problem through innovation. And, uh, and if it didn't, you just innovate again. You just keep trying new things until you find something that works. 
and then how do you then you iterate on that to make it better. So constant improvement. One of the things, if you're in the retail business, we don't have any patents. We don't have any way to prevent um, competition. Everybody can see what you're doing. They can copy you. Uh, they can hire your employees away, your team members away to bring over intellectual capital. And at the end, um, it's, it's what the ability to innovate is your only real lasting competitive advantage. Now, if you're in technology business and you can create um, technology that isn't easily replicable and you can patent, you can create you know, barriers to entry, moats, et cetera. But in the retail business, you've just got to keep getting better all the time. And one of the things Whole Foods did until, until uh, our competitors began to study us and also because until our bureaucracy got to start slowing us down internally, uh, we just continued to out-innovate everybody. One of the things I love about conscious leadership, um, in addition to the fact that you actually see capitalism as a potential force for good in the world. Not a potential force for good. It is the greatest good in the history of this planet. Capitalism has lifted humanity literally out of the dirt in the last 250 years. Let me just give some statistics because I'm, I'm like a super fanatic about capitalism. 250 years ago, 94% of the people alive lived on less than $2 a day, 94%. Illiteracy rates were over 90%. The average lifespan was 30. It has been capitalism taking the, to be able to take the, the enlightenment knowledge that professors come up with and operationalize that that's, and then spread it around the world that's creating this tremendous prosperity. And so, yes, capitalism. You're a fan. You've come to the right place. Well, um, I don't know. I've been booed in business schools before. <laughs> I, I think, though, that what's really interesting, even just about the, you know, the thesis of your book, is I find myself also wanting to say you have been living proof that the reverse is true, that not only can you elevate humanity through business, but also that humanity is what elevates business. Um, a huge part of your competitive advantage at Whole Foods has been your mission, your people, and your culture. Um, talk to us about building that. I think Whole Foods, we were always mission-driven. I mean, even at the very beginning before we uh, – entrepreneurs tend to be very driven people, and they tend to be pursuing a kind of dream. And so a lot of times they have this higher purpose, but they haven't – it's tacit. They haven't yet made it conscious. They haven't made it explicit. But that doesn't mean they're still not chasing after it. And so at the very beginning, what, what was Whole Foods' higher purpose before we articulated it? Um, Back then, I'd say it was to sell healthy food to people, sell natural and organic foods, healthy foods to people. Secondly, we needed to earn a living. And third, have fun, because we were just kids, just having fun. And, uh, and you know, and those still all exist at Whole Foods. They are, you know, we have a, our articulated higher purpose now is to nourish people on the planet. I say ours, I did retire on September 1st, but, I, you know, it's like my kids are all grown up, but I still love them. <laughs> so um, so the, the, the purpose and the mission for us was there at the beginning. So it's not like an MBA that says, ah, what, are some market, uh, what are some market opportunities here? Let's do a research study and determine the market opportunities. We didn't think that way. We were thinking about, let's start a grocery store up and see what we can do with that. That will be fun. Um, and so we just had passion about that. So the purpose was always there. And then... The culture, the cultures of a business come from, it starts with purpose, by the way. That's the first and most important element of a culture. And then second are the values that you operate your business with, the core values, we call them at Whole Foods. And then, then I'd say the leadership principles, how you execute in the world. Those things together really create the culture. And we've just always been very caring about our people. I think from the very beginning we cared about our team members and built our business we knew that if we were going to compete with the supermarkets, we had to create better customer service. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do it mostly by having happy team members. Happy team members results in happy customers, which results in happy investors. So I always think business has been, you know, I'm, I'm not a shareholder value uh, person. I'm, I, I think shareholder value, it's like happiness. If you pursue happiness in life, you probably will not experience it. You probably experience a lot of narcissism, quite frankly. That happiness is something as a byproduct of, of purpose, relationships, love, uh, 
doing things that you really care about, those result in happiness, but they're indirectly a result. I think profits are an indirect result of creating value for other people. So the purpose of a business comes from the value creation that you're doing in the world. So if we ask, you know, if you go to a cocktail party and you ask people what's the purpose of business, what are people going to tell you generally? Anybody? Make money. Make money. What are, are they going to say even, they're going to look at you, what do you mean what's the purpose of business? Everybody knows the purpose of business. It's to make money. Really? What's the purpose of a doctor? They're very well compensated to heal people. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of a teacher? I think it's to educate. Exactly. Uh, he gets paid a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> What's the purpose of, uh, of architects, design buildings, engineers construct things? Every one of the professions refers back to some type of value creation they're doing in the world. The money follows from that. Business has been unfairly slandered by the people that hate business, which, by the way, is generally intellectuals, and that goes back a long way. Intellectuals have never liked business people. Study your history. Read your Deidre McCloskey. Um, the intellectuals have always looked down on business people as just money grovers. Um, and so they have defined business as just about money. But the entrepreneurs that create it, yes, they want to make money. Yes, we want to make money, but that's not generally what drives us. It's secondary. And the profits come from the value creation that we create in the world. That's why business is the great value creator in the world. It's all funding for all governments, all funding for all nonprofits, all of it comes from business, all of it, no exceptions. They're the wealth creators. John, you're, you're reminding me of a John K. book uh, called Obliquity, where he argued that nothing that matters in life can be pursued directly. Not happiness, not success, not any of the things we deeply care about. Uh -huh. Sounds like you subscribe to that vision. I, I do. I think it sounds like I need to read that book. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to go that far because I think you, you've already lived it. But um, what is it that makes it so hard about saying, okay, I know what happiness looks like and I can follow it. I know what success looks like and I can make a plan to achieve it. Good question. And I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking about things and uh, creating strategies for them as long as you understand that, um, that the happiness and the profits are indirectly created. You can create a plan around that. Um, certainly business does lots of planning. You have to, you're not going to make any profits if you don't have some plans for it. So I'm not completely arguing that you shouldn't plan anything. I'm just trying to make you aware that if you, I mean, if you become obsessed with making profits, you're probably going to wreck the business. Imagine for a second, somebody comes to work at Whole Foods, and I'm doing an orientation on the first day, and I say, welcome to Whole Foods Market. I'm so glad you're here. While you're here, your job is to maximize profits and shareholder value. Any questions about that? I think people are going to say, oh, I'm so excited about that. So if you come in and say, we're here to help people. We're trying to improve the whole food system of the world. We're here to upgrade and promote organic and regenerative agriculture. We're here to help people eat healthier diets, and your job is to contribute to that. Which one's going to inspire people? Which one will result in more profit in the long run? The strict focus on profits or the strict focus on creating value in the world and the profits following from that? So, yes, you plan, but you have to understand uh, the, the larger scope of everything. Speaking of planning, you are not a fan of 10-year business plans. Or even five-year business plans. Why not? The pl I mean, you should plan, but you should take the plan and not take it too seriously. Mm. Because you need the plan in order to, first of all, if you're way off track, then the plan can help you think you need to rethink. It's like, well, I've got a new business I'm starting up. We're building the business model on it, which will probably won't work, but when you do the business model, it's like, my gosh, we're going to have to do something differently here. Or we're not going to, we're going to fail. So you have to do planning. So I'm not saying, and, but a 10 year plan is ridiculous, to be honest. It's ridiculous because the world will never, you'll no one ever fulfilled a 10 year plan. And uh, uh, it, it gives people a false sense of confidence. A plan is like, I remember, uh, well, what can I not say here? <laughs> um, Nothing yet. Go on. Uh, well, I'm going to be careful here. Um, well, 
Amazon's a big fan of tenure plans. <laughs> <laughs> and they have, and one of the reasons they wanted to acquire Whole Foods was because of our success in, in, in the food retailing business, and they want to be very successful in that, in that, in that area, and they have a lot of tenure plans for it. The first time they gave me the tenure plan, I'm not going to tell you what the numbers were, but they were so ridiculous. And I said, this is never going to happen, which pretty soon they stopped including me in the meetings. <laughs> Seriously, I got cut out of the meetings. It sounds like you didn't mind, though. But I don't know my feelings were hurt because I knew so much more than any of them they did about this particular business. So they should have been listening to me, and everything I predicted was, was coming true. So um, plans give you this false sense of confidence. And, and a lot of times they, it's like they tweak the plan and then they, they – the first few years don't look good, but you look good in year seven, eight, nine, and ten. It's like, oh, we're still on track. It's like, no, you're not on track. Um, so it gives people a false sense of confidence. Also, a plan can misdirect because people begin to be concerned about making the plan. We got to make the plan. We're, our bonuses depend on the plan, um, and we're, we're behind. So then they start making decisions that are bad for the business. You know, that the, but in order to make the plan come true. So the plan, it's like, it, it's good. It's good. It's a good mental exercise. It's good to think it through. But then you have to realize, you have to be very flexible. Plans are there to be, um, to be, to point you in a certain direction. But then if you if you start to become a slave to the plan, you're going to screw your business up. It's. Uh, I think it's it's been sad to watch. Actually, a lot of founders not learn that lesson until after the fact, right? I think this maybe the saddest way to fail is to achieve your goals, and then realize they were the wrong goals. Yeah, very profound. Now, you are capturing something that I think we teach here. Where, where are Ethan Mollick's students? Anyone? OK, we've, we've got a few. So Ethan will tell you the science is really clear that it actually is beneficial to write the business plan, but then you don't want to get too attached to it. And so that's essentially where you're landing. You know, a book I read a long time ago by Henry Mintzberg. Oh, we have a Mintzberg disciple in the house. I didn't say disciple. I read a lot of his books. But I remember reading, <laughs> oh, I remember okay. reading Strategy Safari, and he, and he just described the different frameworks that you can use. An entrepreneurial framework, that's the one I like the best. Then there's a planning framework, and there were several other frameworks for the way people would think about the business. They all have a use. They all have a value. But if you become a slave to any of them, you're going to miss what – the different framework can teach you. It's good to be, uh, there's probably a word for it, but you can be multi-perspective, take multi-perspectives into place, different frameworks, different mental models, because no mental model, you can be trapped in a mental model, and yet it's a tool. So you don't, just like the plan is valuable as long as you don't become trapped by the tool, a slave to the tool. One of my favorite Mintzberg findings was that many managers spend at least a third of their time total just mediating conflicts between people. Um, this is not something that is unfamiliar I I, to you. I don't. I don't. At all. No. I will tell you the best way to mediate conflicts with people. Um, never get into a he said, she said type of situation where it's like there, there's somebody's complaining to you and somebody else complaining. When anybody ever comes to complain to me about something, I said, okay, let's, you're, you're unhappy with Tom. Let's, you, me, and Tom get together and talk about this. All of a sudden, they don't really want to do that. Uh, frequently, the conflicts get resolved. It's it's not unlike parents might do with their kids, which is one one kid says, you know, goes to daddy to get something and mommy to get something else. You got to have the parents got to be on the same, you know, same team. And and so I think most conflicts are um, can be resolved by bringing the party together and. So all parties together are discussing it and, uh, and then getting mutual agreements to take place. Where do you start that conversation? Cause oh, one other important thing. If you're really purpose-driven and mission-driven, the best way to avoid conflicts is to keep everybody focused on the mission and purpose because a lot of the conflicts come when people have too much time on their hands. And so they begin to say, that, his office is bigger than mine. Is that fair? You know, Whole Foods is something that's very radical. We had open books. Everybody saw what everybody else got paid. You think, that's ridiculous. You should never do that. Very smart thing to do. First of all, it creates, uh, it, does it solve the envy problem? No, of course not. Human, human Envy is part of human nature. So people are going to be envious. But then 
you have to be able to justify the pay differential. And that's a learning opportunity for people. It's like, well, yeah, I pay, we pay uh, uh, Cindy more than we pay you because, and you give all the reasons why, and we'd pay you this much if you were to do these things. So it also, it, po it points people uh, in the right direction. But lots of dissatisfaction has to do with comparative pay. It's, it's, if people think their peers are getting paid more, and by the way, people always compare anybody that's getting paid less than them, that is justice. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody making more, that's unfair. And so, and I don't know of anything that creates more dissatisfaction than pay differentials, so you have to, have, you have to be able to always justify it. By the way, a lot of conflicts have to do with that envy about pay. Best to do to minimize that. You reminded me of the research on capuchin monkeys, uh, where they're perfectly happy chomping on cucumbers until they see the monkey next to them gets a grape, and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> uh, good, good comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're, we're more ape-like than we like to admit. But what? Um, so, what do you do when you sit people down to mediate their conflict? How do you get them to to tell each other something productive? You know, one of the things that Whole Foods does, I'm going I'm to deflect that question, but we're going to come back to it. Uh, one, of, one of our best strategies that we do, or did, and they still do it. I don't think they've ruined everything after I left yet. Um, <laughs> one of the things that uh, we do, and we're doing this in my new business, is we, we end all the meetings with appreciations. Mm. This is a completely revolutionary idea. I don't know why. And I try to spread this because it's so easy to do. You end the meeting and you take, you know, 15, 20 minutes for the people in the group to appreciate each other if they want to. It has to be voluntary. If it's not voluntary, and, you know, people know the difference between an authentic appreciation and uh, flattery because you can feel it, right? You, we all know the difference. We all know when somebody's kissing up to us and we know when somebody's really doing an authentic appreciation. Well, so many conflicts are headed off by at the past, so to speak, because... When somebody is appreciating you, it's you rethink them, right? God, you know, I didn't, I, I can't, I can't. I will give you just a trivial example of this. As I was exiting Whole Foods Market, one of the um, regional vice presidents, one of our regions, I was pretty sure this guy really dislikes me. I always got a bad vibe for him from him. And when we were leaving, when I was leaving the company, he came up to me and he he done this whole big artwork for me that he'd worked on. It took him. God knows how many hours to do. And he said, you've changed my life. You've made such a difference in my life. I'm so deeply grateful for you. And it was like, gosh, Mark, I wish you'd known. I wish I'd known this a little. I didn't say this. I was thinking it. It's like, yeah. But I realized I had totally misjudged him. But when I got that authentic appreciation, he was crying and everything. It's like, wow, I've got to rethink this. I have a, this is different than what I thought. So when people authentically appreciate you, you rethink them, meaning the judgments that you're doing, you stop judging them and you start seeing them differently. But if you also appreciate people, that's the great, the biggest advantage of appreciation is you cannot do an authentic appreciation without opening your heart. It's impossible. Meaning, opening your heart means your love. Love comes out. Appreciation is a form of love. So most conflicts get headed off by creating a culture of love, a culture of appreciation, and therefore avoiding the conflicts. Now, back to what you said. What happens if that doesn't work? Well, um, generally bringing the parties together and talking about it, like I mentioned previously, heads it off and you can get certain agreements and whatnot. And sometimes people really, you know, envy being what it is and competitive being what it is. Sometimes you just need to separate people and you get them on different teams because they don't work well together and they don't like each other and they're not ever going to appreciate each other because they think the other person's a monster. So sometimes separation is the best strategy. And then... You know, frankly, if people are got really crummy attitudes like that, um, yeah, you begin to uh, you want to you want to get them out of your organization. I imagine you occasionally see some color of full responses to these appreciation moments. So, um, yeah, I'm thinking about a meeting I had last week, and if somebody called for appreciation, my response would have been, "I really appreciate that this meeting is over." <laughs> what, what do you do then? Um, I don't know. Not, that's never really happened. Really. No. All right, I need to come to more of your meetings then. <laughs> ah, it, I always tell the story. It took, it took about 10 years before I could get the board of directors at Whole Foods Market to end the meetings on appreciations. After we began appreciations, 
I never had a director voluntarily retire from Whole Foods. And that, and when the activists attacked Whole Foods, they had, one of the ways they attacked us is this, your board has to, they, these people have been here 15, 20, 25 years. That's bad governance. <laughs> Apparently good governance is turning your directors over frequently. Um, and so pe our, our directors loved Whole Foods. They didn't want to leave. And part of that was because we had that culture of appreciation. You mentioned activist shareholders. Uh, you've had your, your share of critics over the years. Um, what would you like to say to the people who are naysayers? On, I mean, in some ways, it seems like they contradict each other, right? Because you have the activists saying this is not a, a viable business. And then on the other side, you have uh, so-called uh, humanitarians saying, you know, you're not really in it for the right reasons. What do you say to both groups? I think the best approach in life is generally to forgive everybody. So. If you hold on to grudges, you're only poisoning your own soul. So I have nothing to say to them, but I wish you well. Wow. <laughs> All of them? Why not? There's not like, one person you would like to see fail. Like, there's, there has to be a, an ounce of schadenfreude. No. I mean, have I ever felt those emotions? Of course I have. I'm a human being. But once you become conscious of it, you can choose to... I, I recognize holding on to anger or hatred, or bitterness, you're poisoning your own inner heart. Those are, that's toxic, toxins, get rid of it. And forgiveness is the key. Let it go, forgive them, move on. And so that's the, I practice that. Oh, so interesting. All right, you could probably just throw that water on me. I'd be mad if initially, but then, you know, it's like, eh, Adam. Should we run the experiment? <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, see if, let's see if John really means it. Okay, uh, let's do it. <laughs> to do when he least expects it. Um, John, let's do a lightning round. I'd uh, love to get your, your quick reactions on a, a bunch of things that I know some people in the room are curious about. Uh, first one is favorite food at Whole Foods. <laughs> favorite food at Whole Foods? You know, my favorite food in general is I love beans. <laughs> I do. I love beans. I love every, I never met a bean I didn't love. <laughs> That's a great answer. All right. Uh, secondly, worst advice you've ever gotten? The worst advice I've ever gotten? Uh, was my father's advice to me when Whole Foods went public. And he said, John, you're rich. Sell some of your stock because you can, you know, you can, you, you, you. my dad was the Depression. He grew up in the Depression. And when he was dying, one of the last things he told me, he says, I always thought that the Great Depression was going to come back. He said, I could have been a lot richer if I had bet on prosperity rather than depression. And I sold way too much of my stock too early on. If I'd let it if I'd understood compounding when I was 28 years old I, or 30 years old, I'd be a lot wealthier man. But that's the worst advice I ever got. But I'm still really wealthy, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it worked out okay. <laughs> um, what is uh, what is the the worst advice that you see given to people at this stage in their lives, uh, undergrads, grad students? Well, it's hard to say what the worst advice is because I think that's very person dependent and I think it can vary tremendously. Um, as an entrepreneur, I think most people play it too safe in life. We're very security oriented. There's so much fear. And listen, when you're young, you don't realize this, but life is so much shorter than you realize. And it's too short to not follow your heart. Follow your heart. Every one of us is called to a hero's journey. Answer the call. Stop being so afraid. Answer the call. You'll be so much happier. You're going to have a life is this grand adventure if you will embrace it and live it. That's what you should do. So that's that, I always try to give young people that advice. Follow your heart. I don't know where that's going to lead you, but it's going to lead you to some adventures. And you're going to learn, and you're going to grow, and you're going to you're going to have the you know. You're going to have meet the great love of your life, and, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of excitement there. There's risk. You know, you could fail. So what? You know, you'll, you'll learn from the failures, and then you'll be better, and you'll be stronger from it. Um, just don't play it safe in life. You, you, that'll be a regret when you get to the end of the life. It's like, ah, I wish I'd done this and this and this. You know, I've got to be honest. I don't really have any regrets. I really don't, and I think that's a good way to live. Is there a book you think everybody in the room should read that doesn't have your name or my name on it? Because <laughs> I know where you're going with this. Yes. I recommend everybody read 
Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. Because this generation has been terrified. This is the best time it ever to be alive is right now. And Pinker documents and he proves it. There's also another book out that's in a similar genre called Superabundance that's just come out. Uh, this is the greatest time to be alive. Do we have problems and challenges? Yes. Smaller than almost any other generation's ever had. And yet people are terrified. We've been terrified by um, doom and gloom scenarios. And by the way, your job is to solve those problems. So that's, you know, you know should take, those, take that as a challenge. But optimism is a very important psychological quality to have. Optimists live longer. Optimists are happier. Optimists have more fun, and yet we're being we're systematically teaching young people to be scared and afraid, and they don't want to reproduce, and it's just such a sad time to be alive. No, read those books. I promise you, this is so great to be alive right now. Can't disagree well, well, you know with that. You know, I like to always I put this challenge out to you. I'll give you the entire history of the human race. You could be alive any time in the entire history of the human race. Tell me when it's ever been a better time to be alive than right now. You've got the whole history, and I bet you can't come up with the time. Maybe you could say 2019 before COVID, but that's kind of the same time. I don't know. I think I, some people would say 2007. 2007? Yeah, the 2008 financial crisis that came along right after that. Well, you didn't say you have to keep going forward in time, right? You just said you get to be alive any time, right? So. Well, yeah, well, you could go back in time. You could, you know, then you could just invest in Apple and, and uh, <laughs> put your money in Berkshire Hathaway. And, yeah, you, but I'm saying that this is the best time to be alive right now. I'll endorse that. Um, this is not a lightning question, but you can give a lightning answer to it if you want or a long answer. Um, how did you navigate the decision about, you had a lot of opportunities to sell over the years. How did you decide that it was time to sell? You know, uh, I didn't want to sell the business. I mean, we got the shareholder activist. That was, you know, the biggest mistake that I made, it's interesting to say 2007, the biggest mistake I made at Whole Foods was uh, when we came out of that, the Great Recession, I mean, Whole Foods market stock price, dropped 90%. We were selling at two times our own cash flow. You could have bought our company and we could have, we paid for it with our own cash flow in just two years. And so, and it was like, when we came out of that, um, our stock just kept going up and up and up. It, re, it, re, it got all its value back and then it just kept going up. Our same store sales were 10%, uh, double digit comps. Um, our profits were going through the roof. And our prices, uh, our gross margins were going up. And when I asked my team about it, I said, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. How can our gross margins be going up um, if we're not raising prices? And, you know, my team said, well, John, because we're getting it on the buy side and we've lowered our shrink, and that's how we're doing it. And, and, and you're, uh, that's a desirability um, uh, in his book. Um, I think, again, I fell prey to something I wanted to believe. I wanted to believe that, but what I should have done is I should have said, that doesn't make any sense. I better investigate deeper because what Whole Foods should have done coming out of that recession is we should have been, um, we should have been lowering our prices. Instead, we got greedy, and the team got greedy, and I was all too eager to believe what they were telling me, and I didn't look any further, and that proved to be a big mistake. And then our competition began to duplicate our prices, a lot of our marketing, they started making their stores look a lot better. They were no longer hypnotized by Walmart. They were concerned about Whole Foods. And we began to get undercut in price. So it was when we got the shareholder activists attacking us, I looked at it and I thought, holy crap, we need to do lower prices. But when you're selling something for a dollar and you lower it to 90 cents, what happens? Initially, your sales plummet, your, your same store sales also drop, your gross margins decline, and the business uh, goes down. And there'll be a lag period once you do that in six to nine months. That's a good move. I didn't think Whole Foods had the time to do that with the activists. So we were trapped. We, excuse me, we needed to cut our prices, but I didn't think we could do that. We were, I thought we we're going to get sold. And we're going to get sold to some, we're not going to be picking who sells us. We're going to go out to the highest bidder. And we looked at all the different alternatives. We looked at, um, talked to Warren Buffett. 
he made a joke about, I own Dairy Queen, for God's sake. Whole Foods is not a good fit for my brand. <laughs> good point. Um, and I looked at different things. And then I had met Jeff Bezos um, the year before and really liked him. He's an entrepreneur, and we, we sort of hit it off. And I thought, you know what? Maybe Amazon would be interested in this. They got their Amazon fresh. I know that's not doing very well. We contacted them. They were very interested. And we flew down there, met with Jeff and his team. And it was like love at first sight. It was like... We you had that. You know how when you fall in love, you have that conversation. You may stay up all night, and it's like, he's the one. He's the one. Well, that's what happened with Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they weren't the one, but they were the best alternative at that time. And that's and we sold out to them because <laughs> you can fall in love. You can talk yourself into it. Any, anyhow, um, if I had to go back. You know, the, the path not chosen is the path, what if we'd fought? I actually decided that if we fought, we'd probably lose. But you know what? That's probably what my heart wanted to do, so I didn't take my own advice. So, hey, I just said I had no regrets. Actually, this is a regret. So th this, is, this, this is what uh, maybe the, that I'm going to get out of this um, coming here is to get more clear that that is a regret for me. I wish... I'll never know what would happen if we'd fought the activists to keep our independence. But because Amazon had so, was so attractive to us, they were, they were really smart people, very brilliant people working there. And uh, they really wanted us, you know. They really liked us. They really uh, – and they promised we could cut prices, and they did. We cut it. We did four major price cuts. Um, and they, we, the technology, right? I, the just walk out technology is such a huge breakthrough, and even though it hasn't caught on, it will. Who wants to go line up in a line when you can just grab stuff and leave and get, you know, get, I mean, it's so, that's a no-brainer. So Amazon was the best fit for us at that time, and, uh, uh, but, yeah. But, you know, I, I will tell you, you know how you, everybody, we create our own narrative? I decided that I had to sell Whole Foods because I would never have left it. And now I'm starting another business that I'm back in startup mode. I'm having the time of my life. I'm having so much fun. I know what the hell I'm doing this time. I've got, I'm rich. I've got a lot of capital I can put into it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't think I would have ever done this next thing. And I I'm, I'm, love life is something I'm really excited about. So uh, I'd say the universe pushed me in that direction so that I could fulfill my next purpose in life. Well, I was going to say, it's, it's really fun to see you do your rethinking in real time, right? Live here on stage, because as soon as you said, if only, I was like, oh, Dan Pink called that out. That is the hallmark question of regret, right. um, is when you say, if only, you're like, oh, there's a tinge of, I could have, should have, would have. Um, but to your point, I think you've found something potentially greater. So what can you tell us about love life? Well, not your love life. Love life. <laughs> yeah. It's love dot life, by the way. We got that URL. So, um, what I can tell you is, is that it's going to be a combination of super healthy restaurants, a fitness club like Equinox, but with yoga and a spa. So a lot of wellness modalities. But the main driver of the business model is medical. Um, we believe that. Um, this, this country is so sick. I'm not looking. This looks like a pretty healthy bunch here. But statistically, 74% of adult Americans are overweight and 42.5% are obese. And those trend lines have not peaked. They're still going up. And we know how to, we know how to cure that. It's, it's, it's through diet and lifestyle, people can reverse it. Nobody needs to get heart disease. It's the leading killer uh, nobody needs to get type 2 diabetes. No one should be obese. Most autoimmune diseases are manageable or reversible. We, we know how to change this. We know what to do, and we're going to do it. And uh, so I, this is, I like Simon Sinek's book. That's another book I'd recommend, The Infinite Game. And business is an infinite game. Love life is an infinite game. And so Whole Foods is an infinite game. So we're creating that to outlive me and hopefully – to be successful and have lots of imitators. And I fully believe 20 years from now, we will think about medicine differently. When do people go see a doctor? When we're sick. When we're sick. The doctor's job is to keep you from getting sick. That's their job. And that's how, when we rethink medicine, 
We think about uh, strengthening the immune system, helping people to be the best version of themselves. We're all on a health continuum. One of the, one of the le revenue streams for Love Life is to do a deep assessment on you, get your baseline, get you to wear an Apple Watch and an Aura Ring and to track yourself, to do continued uh, updates regularly, have a dashboard and you can see exactly how healthy you are, you can see the progress you're making, and have a team of professionals working with you to be the healthiest, best version of yourself. That's, that's the vision, and so that's what Love Life's going to be about. Probably some of you will be working for me in a few years. <laughs> it's so interesting because your, your vision is in some ways foreshadowed by uh, the founder of what I think should have been called Benjamin Franklin University, but instead is the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, didn't Franklin write once that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Well, he, Franklin's one of my heroes, and I think he wrote that in Poor Richard's Almanac, right? Yeah. Either that or in a letter under a pen name. I haven't gotten to the bottom of that one yet, but more research to do for anyone who wants to figure it out. Um, okay, we have a bunch of audience questions I haven't gotten to yet, so I want to make sure I cover a few, to, a few of them at least. Excuse me. Um, I'm not going to ask you uh, why you sold. I'm not going to ask you about Amazon. Uh, well, we just already talked about both of those, right? Yes, we did. Um, a lot of the questions are there, so we covered that ground. I am going to ask you. Um, what do you think, there are a few food questions here that people are curious about. Uh, one is, what do you think are the biggest challenges that lead to the large amount of food waste that we have in this country and in the world? And what kinds of innovations do we need to solve that? First, I'm less concerned about food waste than most people are because, I mean, food is, is um, it's a renewable resource. We're always growing more food and there's, and I don't know how many times Whole Foods would be attacked because, you know, like, what are you doing about your food waste? And it's like, I mean, it's, people aren't buying enough. We don't, we don't want to waste food. So we, when we get the feedback from the market, we do what we can to, you know, buy less in that area, but we want to be abundant. Um, so, and we also, Whole Foods gives so much food to food banks. It's unbelievable what we, what we recycle into food banks. So, um, that's not, that's a problem for you to solve because I have no interest in it. <laughs> Excellent. Hopefully there's somebody in the room who's going to take you up on that. Um, okay, next question. Uh, what is um, your strategy for shaping consumer preferences? Because a lot of people went out to find out what they were and then appeal to them. You mentioned earlier that you were actually also creating them. How? Oh, honestly, it's like, I think Steve Jobs had the most famous thing. I mean, you know, he, he was disdain marketing research. He said, if, if you'd done marketing research before they did the iPod, no one would tell you they needed an iPod. They needed a better CD player. Can we get another 20 songs onto a CD? Uh, so marketing research, so you shape preferences by understanding what's possible that's kind of disruptive or transformative. What's the new big thing? What's this chat? Uh, uh, how many of you guys have done that? Chat GPT? Yes. <laughs> how many people have done that already? Raise your hand. Right? So that's, did you know you needed that before you uh, did it? Probably not. But are you going to use it all the time now? Yes. yes. Exactly. <laughs> no. Are you, are you writing your paper uh, via? <laughs> so the point is, is that you shape consumer preferences by creating things they didn't, people didn't know they wanted or needed. But then once they saw it, it's like, duh. You know, people ask me, John, what's different today when you were a student, at, you know, on the University of Texas? What's different on the campuses? I said, well, back when I was walking on the campuses, we were mostly looking at all the beautiful women uh, on the campus. And today, everybody's looking at their phone when they walk around. <laughs> <laughs> we have some people doing both, yeah. apparently. So one of the, one of the things I've, I've often thought about on this particular dilemma is, uh, I think one of the, the jobs lines was, a, I think, an apocryphal Henry Ford quote, which is, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse, uh, which I guess Henry Ford never actually said, but it's a good line. Um, I think the, the problem this illustrates for me is customers aren't good at envisioning solutions because they don't have access to your technologies, your tools, your strategies to even know what kinds of solutions would be possible. What they are good at, though, is identifying problems and telling you what their existing sources of pain are. Agree or disagree? Agree. 
OK, that's disappointing. Um, OK, so given that you agree, oh, no. <laughs> given that you agree um, how, how did you go about and how do you go about figuring out what those core problems are for a customer? Well, um, first, you, first you talk to your customers. They, customers do complain. Customers do make suggestions. A lot of them aren't very good, but a lot of them lead to breakthrough ideas. And if you hear a lot of repeats, you know, it's like, um, I mean, let's take an example. Let's take Uber. The first time I used Uber, I was really mad at myself. <coughs> it's like, duh, this is so obvious. Why didn't I do this? It, just, it seems so obvious, right? Uh, and that's oftentimes what happens when, I guarantee you, when you go into your first love life, when, we get our, when you go into our first store, you're going to think, this is so obvious. Why didn't nobody do this before? Because, and and that's, that's what you want to do. You want, you, you're providing solutions to people that didn't know they needed, they wanted the solution, but once they see it, they know they want it, and they, and they get excited about it. That, for the first 20 years when people went into the Whole Foods Market, I remember people said, I've never been into a store like this. Why has nobody done this before? Now it's kind of routine, but in the day, it was very exciting for people. And the first time I used an iPod, it was like, I got my whole music collection on this iPod. Why right look at this little thing. I, every song I like is on this thing right now. <laughs> and of course, now the, the iPhone has obviously transcended that, and they don't even make iPods anymore. So I don't know if I'm answering that question or if I'm rambling. No. Um, next question. I think um, you've touched on some advice here, but I'm sure you have a lot more, and um, several of your books actually have covered much of this ground. So um, the question is, what advice would you give to students interested in management and leadership that we haven't already covered? You know, um, when we wrote Conscious Capitalism, uh, my co-author, Raj Sasodia, who's a professor at Babson, um, brilliant guy, good friend, um, and uh, but when we got into the, the leadership chapters, he could only quote other people. He didn't really know anything about leadership. So I realized, oh, I got to do these two chapters. I really got to concentrate on that. So the best way to learn about leadership is to do it, honestly. It's, it's you learn by doing and then by, and, and then by thinking about what you're doing and then through trial and error and then you do the research. Then you read the books. I remember when I got going, I read everything Peter Drucker ever wrote. Peter Drucker was my early guru. And his big management book, it's like I got that in a flight. This guy seems to know what he's talking about. And he did because when I would read it, I could apply it to the situations I was in. It would make sense. If I didn't have that practical experience, it would just be theoretical. So you have to take the theoretical ideas and translate them into practical realities and you do and you get that by actually practicing management you have to do it you have to practice leadership um, and then you get like anything what happens when you practice something bingo you should be here at Wharton already um, no when you practice something you get more skilled at it like I'm really into this pickleball pickleball is like my new passion and I'm playing pickleball three four five times a week guess what I'm getting pretty good because I play all the, for a 69-year-old guy, I'm getting pretty good because I play and I practice and I'm learning and I'm, I got, I'm reading about it and I'm watching videos on YouTube and I'm taking, I got a coach. And, and so, yeah, I'm getting better because I'm practicing it. That's how you get better at being a leader. You practice it and you're eager to learn and, how, and you want to be a better leader. So you, then the theoretical stuff you take in and you can operationalize it. I know more pickleball fans in Austin than the rest of the world combined. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't. I, I actually think I'll do it. We'll, uh, we'll compare notes later. Um, the, okay, so I'm going to do something a little different from what we normally do here, but I think it'll be fun. Um, our next speaker, uh, I think you probably know her, um, Jenny Rametti from IBM, longtime CEO. Um, maybe you don't. Okay. Um, what, what's the question you would want to ask her about leadership? And I'm going to pose it to her when she comes next month. I don't know because I don't know her. Um, how long has she been the CEO? Long time. How long is a long time? I actually don't know off the top of my head. I think it's been over a decade. I guess, is that a long time being a CEO? I was a CEO for 44 years. It's, it's been <laughs> for, for companies that have been in the Fortune 500 for a long time, that's an eternity, right? Wow. Um, Average CEO is less than four. You know, I wouldn't ask her a question about leadership. I would always ask a question about um, the business model. Is IBM's business model sustainable? I mean, I, the way technology evolves and changes, I mean, 
is, is, is Google under threat by um, something like uh, chat? Is it is under threat by that? I mean, would you, why would you do a search? I, I think it might be, right? For accurate information. Exactly. For, so technology can disrupt whatever business platform you have can be, can be tossed out fairly quickly. And change is accelerating. So how's IBM? My, my question is a strategic one. How are you guys prepared for technological disruption going into, you know, as everything's accelerating, how's IBM? You, you know, when I was younger, first it was, we got to break up General Motors. They're a monopoly. Well, I live to see them go bankrupt, so so much for having a monopoly. All you needed to do was open up the automobile market to the Japanese and the Germans, and then they, you know, kind of wiped them out. Um, and then I watched... IBM was the next monopoly. Got to break up IBM. They're going to own everything in technology. And then, you know, Apple came along, when, uh, Microsoft came along, and all of a sudden, uh, IBM is still a great company, but it wasn't this gorilla any longer. Then it was Microsoft. We've got to break up Microsoft. And, you know, now it's kind of like a fang. You've got, uh, you got Amazon, and you've got Facebook, and you've got Google, and uh, uh, who am I leaving out? Uh, Apple. And, and so ah, there's always the next monster, and yet the technology continues to innovate. And by the way, big corporations always get weighted down by bureaucracies, and innovation begins to become difficult. So IBM, it's a miracle that they've been able to stay up there so long. So they're obviously doing something right. They must have a strong culture. But that would be my question. How are they going to handle continued technological disruption? That's a great question from a, uh, a passionate fan oh, of free markets. From a grocer. Uh, I will, uh, I'll report back on what Denny says. Okay, um, since you're such a curious per person, I'm going to give you two other questions to ask. One is, what's something you would like to know from our audience of students? How many of you are going to start your own business someday? How many of you are entrepreneurs? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are going to start your business, have already started it, or will start it immediately upon graduation or getting your MBA? Keep it, raise your hand. The ones that have your hands up now, you are the ones that will start businesses. The rest of you probably won't. <laughs> the reason why is it's about passion and following that passion. And if you're choosing safety, what's going to happen is you're going to get Amazon's going to hire you or McKinsey's going to hire you. They're going to pay you $250,000. And you got debts you got to pay off. And you're going to buy a house. And uh, and then you're going you're gonna to have kids. and. It's a dream that will always be in the distance. Sounds harsh. I've been watching it happen since I came here in 2009. It's not harsh. It's just, just what happens. Uh, life, life moves on, and you get ta entangled in it. I would not bet against your prediction for most. I think there will, a few, there will be a few now who, just, who do it just to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, yeah, which is what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, OK, so Don, you kept, uh, earlier you kept trying to ask me questions. I, I will do the question asking around here, but I'm going to give you the floor for a second. What's the question you have for me? What's your next book about? <laughs> oh, uh, that, is, uh, that is a refreshing question because normally people tell me what my next book should be about. I'm like, that's a great idea. You go write that. Like, if you think it's a, an exciting topic, you no, but by you, all means. You have to write books about things that you're either passionate about yourself or curious about or it won't be a good book. Exactly. So... I don't, um, I don't know that I can say publicly yet, but... Um, <laughs> oh, that's, how fair is that? Like, but if, <laughs> if, if I did have one due in two weeks, um, and it were coming out in October, it would be about potential and how we can reach it. I think you handed it that in, in your most recent book. I think that is true, and I didn't realize it was that explicit until uh, you just told me it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's, that's very astute. Um, what do you love most about... You only get one question. Okay. <laughs> what, do you love, um, what do you love most about teaching? Why do you continue to teach here at Wharton? What's, what, what, what's in it for you? The, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of reasons. I think the, the easiest one, though, is getting to learn from and be energized and inspired by amazing, brilliant students. I, I feel like I... That's kind of a softball question. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a... I mean, there, what other answer could you get? Like, I, I was really lucky when I was a student to have some professors who changed the way I saw the world um, and really lit a fire under me to want to explore the kinds of questions we've talked about tonight. And I thought the most meaningful thing I could do with my career was try to pay that forward. 
I can guarantee you I've learned a lot more from my students than they've learned from me, and it really is it's what keeps me curious and motivated. So that's, I think, the, the easy answer. You know, I'm good friends with Ed Freeman, who's, uh, you know, teaches a dog. Father of stakeholder yeah. capitalism, sure. Exactly. And, and Ed, he, if, if I recorded your answer, Ed, Ed says the exact same thing. He learns more from his students, and, it, and it's about paying it forward. And, and uh, so I think maybe the best teachers have a similar mindset. I think so, too. And I, could be, I could be a book you could write about. Well, I was going to say, that should be your next book. But <laughs> Oh, you know, actually, I, I'm working on another book right now. It should be out. It'll be out within a year. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's kind of a personal memoir, but it's called The Whole Story. I may not end up being the title, but it is about Whole Foods Market. And I've set, I have a benchmark, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. That's my benchmark. That's my favorite business Great book choice. I've ever read. And it's just a narrative. It's one funny story after another, to be honest with the truth. It's one good story after another. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of getting to relive my past a little bit. It's fun. It's fun. It's, it's hard work writing, but it's also very fun and rewarding as well. Based on the reactions in the audience, I think you've got some early reader volunteers in the room. Yeah, I'm doing a little marketing push right there. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, John, let me, uh, let me just say two things. One, um, just such a delight to have you here. It's, um, it's really refreshing to see how candid you are. Uh, it's not something we get every day from founders and CEOs. And two, I wanted to give you the floor to offer a closing piece of wisdom or advice. You know, I already gave, I already gave my closing piece of advice for you, which is um, you have this amazing life ahead of you. You do. It's, you're, you're, I, had, I once had a student come up to me in a, in a situation like this, and, and he said, Mr. Mack, I just want you to know you're one of my heroes. I so much admire you. I, I wish I could be like you. And I said, well, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. And, then, and I, said, What's I said, I'll give you. You can be me. I will give you all my money, everything I have, if you will just give me your youth, I'll make that trade. And then I could see the light bulb going off in his head. It's like, it's the adventure itself that's the great joy. And when you're young, you have so much potential, and life lies in front of you. And it's the greatest, precious thing. You'll know this when you get older, for sure. It's the best thing in life. You're young, you're smart. You're creative, and you have this grand adventure ahead of you. So my advice to you is live it. Go for it. Follow your heart. Follow your passions. Um, and I, I almost can promise you, some of you will drive off a cliff, but that will be very few. Most of you will have, well, there's no guarantees, right? But most of you will have an incredible life adventure. And so I'm paying it forward to you as well. I've had an amazing life, and it's not done yet. I, and, I, and so... Um, yeah, I wish for you the very best in all ways. I look forward to seeing what you can do. Ladies and gentlemen, John Mackey.